So everybody, this is our first show. Welcome to the Esoteric Review. What we're doing today is we're talking about a film, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, directed by Steven Spielberg, one of the masterpieces of his career. Um, and our guest on this show tonight is Robbie Graham. Robbie Graham is an amazing author. Uh, I, I love his book, Silver Screen UFOs. Saucers. I'm just going to add that up. Saucers, Saucers. Silver Screen. Jesus. Silver Screen Saucers, my bad. We're doing um, great. But we know that <laughs> this is historically the very first you know, name for UFOs, saucers, flying saucers, what they called the uh, UFOs when they first hit the scene in the 1940s. Um, his book really highlights hyper-reality, and that's where Hollywood takes fact in the UFO realm and writes it into history and, and makes it hyper-real. It basically <laughs> is uh, making you not only lose for some people, they lose the context of that thing that they saw on screen. They might think that this is actually fiction, but for other people that understand the UFO subject, um, it becomes hyper real. It becomes something so visceral that you have a greater reaction to what you're seeing on the silver screen. Um, and he, Robert Gra Robbie Graham, is um, very well versed in the film we're talking about tonight, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. He's been in touch and, and involved with many of the filmmaker-related uh, people on set of the film. Um, he knows the whole backstory to how it was made and the context of certain things that are included in the story. Um, but I need to also introduce my co-host here, Brandon Thomas. He has his own podcast as well. You guys should check it out. Experience uh, ex expanding reality. There we go. I've been on that. It's a fun show. He talks about all kinds of things, kind of like we're doing on this show. We talk about films, television shows, uh, books, and we relate the fiction that's in these pieces of media to reality, to things that are happening in history, to things that are factually present in our reality. So, uh, Brandon, say hi, introduce yourself a bit more. Howdy. Uh, Brandon Thomas, Expanding Reality, and um, just a new show. Uh, Darcy, you pretty much covered it, man. Um, looking forward to uh, doing this show with you. So whenever Darcy uh, came up with this idea, we had a conversation about it. I said, absolutely brilliant. This would be great. And I've got a guest for our first show and the first movie that we should do, which is, of course, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, the Spielberg film. Uh, Robbie, you have a whole chapter in your book about it. Uh, you've also been on my show, good friend, and uh, you're in incredibly insightful when it comes to this stuff incredibly knowledgeable uh film major himself uh it, we just like i said could not have gotten a better first guest so uh robbie how you doing man oh good thanks uh brandon and uh, darcy yeah it's great to be talking to you about this it's uh you know good to be on the first show and like i've seen this film so many times but i mean it's been a while so be good to catch up on it so what was I... it like the first time you saw it <clears throat> i was uh 16 and um so it would have been about yeah 1997 oh it's like that was quite late for me I, I grew up on spielberg movies and stuff but i just never for for whatever reason i think it's an it's a more adult movie i think than, than his his uh his usual sci-fi fare and um it just took me a while to get around to it. i recognized that it was something of like a classic and i was doing film studies by that point at college and um i got it on vhs i think i bought it i bought the special edition on uh, on VHS and just put it on and watched it with my brother, um, and by the end of it, I was just completely awestruck and um, just completely swept away by it. And then proceeded to go outside, look up into the sky, and see a UFO, which obviously was not a UFO. It was like the planet Mars or whatever. But it took a, at least half an hour to for me to accept that that was the case. So it's like you know the immediate power of the film. Is that when you sort of first became interested in the UFO subject or did you have a bit of knowledge before the film? 
Oh no, I I I was completely obsessed with UFOs by this point. Um, I always had an interest, but my interest goes back to when I was about seven seven years old, and a friend of mine, a classmate, had a uh, close encounter. His parents had a close encounter with a UFO and he crashed into one, maybe a quarter of a mile from my front door. So I grew up on the edge of Canic Chase in in Staffordshire, which is one of the the UK's paranormal hotspots, Europe's paranormal hotspots for sort of paranormal UFO sightings and things, and um, so I grew up steeped in the local mythology, I guess, and with an interest in anything that was weird and um, impossible. And and so I was reading books about ghosts and stuff like that when I was seven, eight, nine, ten years old. And then by the time I was 14, I just that was when you followed you like when, when uh, sort of X-Files was peaking in the mid 90s. Uh, you had Men in Black on the cinema. Um, uh, Independence Day and this resurgence of interest in, in UFOs in, in, in pop culture and I was just swept away in all of that and then I just sort of started to consume all of the literature and by the time I was about 18 I'd, I'd read a, a lot of a lot of it I involved myself in a local UFO group and met Nick Redfern who was the local guy at, at the time and, oh, and uh, yeah and then I just used to just ring up all of the sort of the big name researchers I'd just find their, their numbers in the back of their books or on their websites in the early days of the internet and i would just ring them up as just like a 16 17 year old kid um just bugging him for like you know what's going on with the dulcy base and tell me about area 51 and <laughs> and he was like yeah right so um let's go around to the pub and uh we can have a drink over it <laughs> yeah well, well accents i don't know if you knew that well, well yeah nick would just nick would just talk to you on the phone um for, for ages but I mean, I would bring up people like Linda Moulton Howe and Stanton Friedman and stuff like that. And I, they were just had no no clue who I was. And um, obviously, I was a 16 year old kid. And <laughs> but they they put up with me. That's, That's so cool. cool. And so when did you, um, you you're an author, you've written two books. The first book, I messed up the name, Silver Screen Saucers. The second book I've seen online. Can you talk about when you first started writing the first book and then, you know, kind of the evolution of your work? Uh, Silver Screen Sources was the product essentially of, <clears throat> in, in 2007, I wrote a series of articles for 14 Times magazine looking at sort of combining um, Hollywood and, and UFOs. I had, was passionate about both of those things at that point. I was obsessed with UFOs, had been since I was a kid. And then by the time I went to college and university, I was deep into sort of film studies and film appreciation and uh, film history. And... Um, I wanted to see if I could write something about UFOs, um, but I wanted a novel take on it, and um, I, I just it was just such a natural. My, my it's my nat naturally the way I look at the subject. Anyway, I come at it through the lens of um, popular perception and of the tools of you know um, of myth creation and which is cinema and um, uh, so I, I for me I, I think that cinema and, and UFOs. Uh, are inseparable in terms of how we conceptualize you know scenarios like first contact and um, you know alien invasion and uh, our relationship to whatever else might be out there is, is essentially cinema yeah. is kind of like a polarizing effect to some of the theories too right like it ends up um, kind of abducting or taking over the uh, the lore sometimes instead of um, the original story for example battle battle of los angeles which you've talked about before uh the battle of la was a, a famous incident that happened in was it 1942 or 1944 42 la 42, 42 yeah. right and then they made the film they put the original photo from the actual incident where they were you know unloading hundreds of shells into the sky to try and take down this UFO object over top of Los Angeles. And, uh, you know, a few people died as a result of shrapnel fire and so on. Um, but no one remembers that incident. Everybody remembers the horrible movie that came out, uh, you know, in the in most recent years. Robbie, that's one of your favorites, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I think generally as a rule, whenever you've got the military or you know, any kind of military power involved in the, in 
in the creative process of filmmaking, I think it's probably a generally a bad mix. Um, and, <laughs> and especially when they try to get involved in the writing process and, um, and, uh, you know, the result is off as well as propaganda. And, and, um, so there's, yeah, there's this, this is a long history of, um, uh, of the US military involving themselves in films like, for example, Battle of Los Angeles, which served as essentially it's, you know, so, so when a, a movie uh, script calls for particular set pieces, action set pieces, then obviously uh, there needs to be budget set aside for pay, to pay for that or to create that either in a computer or, um, you know, through practical means, or you can literally get the real thing from the military um, for free. Um, but in exchange for that free lending of, of uh, authentic hardware, they request access to the creative process. Um, uh, you know, from from conception through to through to post production, and even mark, even sort of you know promotion. Yeah, they get and creative control over the the end product. To, to yeah, to an extent that people would be quite surprised about, I think. Yeah, and, we saw um, what happened with Pearl Harbor because that's definitely not how things went down, right? Mm -hmm. What? <laughs> the film the film pearl harbor with ben accurate affleck. depiction historically accurate yeah oh yeah of course <laughs> nothing but ben affleck was alive there. back then too that's right um cuba gooding yeah. jr just yeah exactly Great so movie. um but sorry to derail you there but let's go to close encounters of the third kind because this is a film where the military kind of came along they said hey we want to have access can creatively to this project, but we'll give you these things in order for you to have those, um, you know, we need creative control. And what happened as a result of that? Well, so with, with uh, Close Encounters, this was, I think, the first movie that Spielberg had ever had to actually request um, military um, support for. I may be wrong, some Spielberg purist may correct me on some kind of dual thing there but I, I don't think so I think I think this was the first time he'd had to approach the military for any assistance <clears throat> and um, he'd been saying publicly for months in the press that, that his film Close Encounters was more science speculation than, speculation than science fiction and that it, you know it was a big deal made of the fact that it was based on fact essentially it was based on the, the largely the work of jail and Heineck at the time and um it even took its name from Heineck's work you know close encounters of the third kind which is why ultimately Heineck ended up getting his cameo in the movie towards the end and um so so yeah this was a film that uh that called for a military presence on screen and so it Spielberg did approach the US Air Force uh for their assistance and he also approached nasa um for those sequences towards the end <clears throat> with the mothership um i think they wanted sort of instrumentation panels and things like that to make it look more more authentic and um i think they even wanted nasa you know personnel um, on there as well but ultimately uh the the air force and nasa both denied spielberg their cooperation on on that production and it was on the same grounds. Essentially, it was it was discomfort over the 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 issue of UFOs. Um, this was this was 1977. So Blue Book had shut down in 1969, and the Air Force's official position at this point was, was that UFOs were not real, or at least they're they're of no interest to the Air Force, pose no defense significance. <clears throat> and um, and so yeah, to be you know ignored or taken lightly, and um, here in stark contrast to that position was them showing to Spielberg that they were concerned about how the subject was represented and received in the popular consciousness. Uh, they recognised that Spielberg was a very powerful filmmaker by this point. He was only in his 20s, still late 20s, I think. Um, but he'd already just made the most successful film of all time with, well, in 75 with Jaws. Um, and then it was surpassed by Star Wars in 77. But but he was like you know this new kid on the block and he was su supremely powerful hugely influential and um uh yeah the powers that be always recognize this the the uh the impact that the narrative has when uh, combined with with image with moving image especially 
so but yeah in in, in reference to what was specifically said in those in those uh letters from the air force and nasa um the air force actually just responded along the lines of um literally in reference to our in reference to our um work on blue book and the closure of blue book uh, our conclusions are that the, the the subject is you know not to be taken seriously and therefore we're actually not going to lend you our support because to do so would be to indicate to the public that we take the subject seriously and they their official position is that we don't but then with nasa nasa actually um according to spielberg nasa were uh more sort of uh, to the point they were saying to to spielberg in this what he said was a 20 page letter that um they didn't want him to make the film at all uh because they felt that it might cause mass hysteria surrounding the subject and it might cause a huge influx of reports that would find their way to to nasa and you know be a big headache for the space agency so yeah the, we did try like, to just like how jaws uh scared the shit out of people and they didn't want to go in the water so they were concerned about the same thing right and now we've got every shark in the ocean that's right yeah yeah well exactly that's it the same they were they were thinking the same thing would happen with your you know with close encounters as it happened with jaws the same director so um yeah and that's that's where spielberg's where it started to get interesting with spielberg and ufos and presidents and um, that would sort of continue as the years went on well why don't we uh play the trailer just to give everybody a bit of a refresher on this masterpiece of a film uh, and then we'll start to talk about segments going along throughout the film from there and things that I kind of found were related to actual UFO history. Um, and uh, you can kind of like add some cherries on top. That was really close. 31, do you wish to file a report of any kind of it? I wouldn't know what kind of report to file, Senator. Dope trailer, yes. by the way. Yeah, yeah great, very trailer. cool. <laughs> Got to buy it on 4K now. So um, let's let's kind of start from the beginning. Um, you know, they the film kind of opens up a bit more like Indiana Jones. It's the middle of the desert. There's this like sandstorm going on. We find out it's Mexico. Uh, just like in many of Steven Spielberg's films at this time, you have a million people yelling or talking at the same time. It's very chaotic. You don't know who to listen to. Um, people are running. This whole film, I don't know if anybody's realized this, but there's always people running. Uh, he must have had everybody do like track and field before they got hired on to the film. But Lots of running at the beginning of the film. They're running around these aircraft that are from a different time period. And, uh, you know, uh, Brandon, you brought up before that this represents the squadron that went missing in, in, in history. Uh, why don't you mention that again? Yeah, from Fort Lauderdale, there was that training exercise uh, in, what, 45, 43 uh, that went missing? And, yeah, there you go. And uh, it was just found uh well they were never found uh is how the story goes and it's kind of a bermuda triangle story which is interesting that it ties in here also the ancillary phenomena that he does pepper in with all the cars and stuff i'll get to that in a second but this story in particular about how the squadron of fighters were just out on a training mission and they just vanished uh the airplanes in this though are depicting that that as if they had found them in socorro mexico which of course it would have just been covered up at that point with everything in perfect condition, like they'd never left. Uh, the calendar, whenever they, whenever he pulls it out of the dash, it's unwrinkled, un, uh, you know, affected. Hello? We got a bit of a lag well, there for yeah, Brandon, have... but I guess we'll take over. We have, you know, the calendar is completely unaffected by time if it really has come from this different era um and you know what kind of things would you say um are interesting that steven spielberg would include that in the story in terms of the, the, the reference to missing time yeah 
Yeah, I mean, this that, that was quite interesting because, I mean, this is quite far ahead of its time. Um, this this movie was written largely, I think, in, what, 70, well, over several years, but I think a lot of it was done in 76, finished in 76, 75, 76. At that time uh, in ufology, uh, the idea of, uh, of missing time in, you know, in, in sort of experience of cases where people claim to have been abducted by aliens or had encounters, close encounters and lost time, you know, had periods of time they couldn't account for, which would eventually become known as missing time. That was something that was just not being sort of discussed uh, at all, really, in, in, in ufology, um, even within the subculture uh, in the mid-1970s. Um, there were a handful of cases scattered across the decades that pointed towards something like that, but no one had attempted to study it um, until Bud Hopkins did in, uh, uh, started to do so in the mid-70s, around that time. And in fact, it would have been um, Joe Alves, Spielberg's production designer on that movie, who would have consulted with people with uh, with people like um, uh, Bud Hopkins and uh, you know and and also J Jalen Hynek, of course, um, who showed him sketches of these grey aliens, which were not again they, these were not something that was uh, this this hadn't become the archetypal image of the of the uh, of the alien at this point. It hadn't embedded itself into popular culture, but this was the first movie to to really take that image in its essentially crystallized form and put it out there um albeit in in a fairly subtle way and but that again was taken from from the pages of, of um, you know of ufo law really at the experiencers time. and and abductees right right exactly right. that's what that's what they were reporting privately in their support groups and talking to their therapists about and those are the drawings that were emerging across the united states and around the world at that at that time um, independently of each other, and then it, and then they started to get filtered into into Media. the pop culture, yeah, into yeah. pop culture narratives. So I did want to discuss quickly um, one of the, you know, just after the segment where the guys are running around uh, the planes, we find this experiencer, the first experiencer, who's this old uh, whitewashed Mexican man. He's got a burnt face, and later on in the film, when we have Richard Dreyfus. He also, uh, you know, witnesses a UFO fly over top of him, uh, over his car, and he gets burnt. Um, this was not something that was very popularly reported in UFO lore at this point either, that people would suffer radiation burning or something like that from experiencing a, a craft. But... If you look back to 1980, there's the Cash Landrum incident uh, where, you know, basically many investigators went out to uh, figure this out. But uh, a woman was driving in, um, I believe, Texas. She was driving home to Dayton, Texas with her daughter. Um, and they saw this UFO, it was December 1929, fly over top of their car over this like sort of forest road um, and it was being paced by two um, twin prop heli like military helicopters and they got really badly burned from the UFO that passed over top of their car. They ended up going to a hospital um, and both of them, their daughter and, and the mother uh, suffered radiation, mm -hmm. uh, you know, burning like they they were radioactive at that point why do you think uh this is relevant you know th again this film was released in 1977 why do you think he wanted to show this physical burning uh to the experiencers in the film i think it was just a ploy by big uh sunscreen actually um it had nothing to do with any phenomena they were just pushing the agenda of sunscreen on people Really? Realist opportunity for a uh, product placement, by the way. Yeah. And we're going to talk about product placement, actually, uh, not too long after this. But I didn't know that. There, that is one thing, you know, we are mm. reviewing the film at this point. You know, point. I'm totally kidding, right? <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm not no. kidding. There's uh, some, if... like, disgusting product placement that happens in this film that, like, really, it happens and you're like, why? And second of all, you're like, okay, like, can we get on with the actual cool part of the film here? Like, anyways, I'll get to it in a sec. 
Apologies, why, Robbie. Robbie, why do you think he's he put burn marks on people's faces? Um, yeah, th 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 that Brandon point though does bring me back to uh, <laughs> like <laughs> advertisers and you know sort of military, you know. Uh, forces becoming involved in the filmmaking process where things are literally i mean there are examples of that of literally you know advertisers obviously i mean especially with the transformers movies oh, which are a perfect example of the military produced films essentially um uh you know, complete cooperation of the entire department of defense and various other agencies including nasa and all sorts of things and then of course all of the the, the whole thing is based on hasbro toys so it's it's the whole thing is product is is product placement the entire movie uh, it's just just product. It's just fill everything in it is a product, and uh, there's just no artistic value in the entire endeavor at all. And uh, but don't get me started. Anyway, so uh, let me, let but that's a UFO you, movie, so it's relevant. Yeah, yeah. well, let, it's a UFO movie. I guess it's like to try and show you know that people uh, had a physical experience. It wasn't just a visual mental experience. So I, I could understand why maybe he added the burns oh, the thing yeah so 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 with with that i think um i think the thing is, i mean the answer that i could probably give for many questions that you might have along similar lines would be that spielberg was a massive ufo geek he was just he was a real nerd and really obsessed with details and facts he know he knew his stuff he'd read a lot of the literature the best literature of the time uh, he made his firelight movie when he was 16 which is essentially the blueprint for Close Encounters, his very first feature length movie that he put together um, about UFOs. So, you know, the very first movie that he made was about UFOs, or a feature length movie, so to speak, was about UFOs. It's a 16 year old kid. And that says a lot about him. And it, it was Close Encounters. You know, Jaws was a, as a directorial, Pro, it was a, it was like a, it was, you know, he was a director for Debut. hire. Debut, yeah. Yeah. And uh, there was more, you know, but and that was just was just practice for him. But his first real movie was Close Encounters of the Third Kind. That's his first really personal movie, and I think it's still his most personal film to date, um, or, or at least I think it's his most heartfelt. I think it's his most heartfelt. He put um, he put a piece of himself onto the screen. Right. Yeah. Right. And it's not perfect, and that's why it's because it's kind of it's kind of messy at part times. This film. Yeah. On, on a narrative level, it's huge plot holes and it's kind of saggy in parts but it doesn't matter yeah. because it's it, but but it, it he did it but it, it's just imbued with with his passion in you know every single frame it's yeah. just you know i wouldn't i wouldn't change anything about it although he's changed a whole bunch about it <laughs> you could liken it to a musician uh, that plays with such passion and um and but it's not always incredibly precise. You might miss a note here or there, but the passion is there, and the enthusiasm is there to continue the piece mm -hmm. and not just stop and obsess over every single little miss note or minor little key change mm -hmm. or something like that. I uh, just kind of an idea would be maybe because it's called Close Encounters of the Third Kind. He had first, which is the sighting. Second would be the evidence. Maybe he needed a Close Encounter of the Second Kind to squeeze in there between the two. He wanted to kind of show all three. Yeah, it's a possibility. The burn yeah, which is, is just the, is the second experience. Yeah, just that makes physical, a lot of sense. Yeah, physical makes contact, a lot of sense. and then if you're going to walk through the stages, then you're like, well, we're going to have aliens in it. So I'm sure now you, you now you said that. I'm sure that's obviously the case. It must be the case. It makes too much narrative sense. Exactly. <laughs> just there we go. Wildly here. There we go. Well, okay. We did mention sunscreen before product placement. This is something that has run right through Hollywood cinema for a long time. Uh, this is actually my most disliked scene of the whole film Roll it. Uh, when I, what's his name billy goes to the kitchen because he hears something rummaging around and literally this has hints of et mm -hmm. you know uh, we yeah. saw in 1982 et is messing around in the house mm -hmm. uh the boy goes out back he can gets confronted by the thing in the shed or something freaks out this scene made no sense to me other than guess what we see on the floor there yeah a little, and little then, product placement yeah, yeah and then what do we see in the fridge at the starting of the shot yeah mm -hmm. just completely mucking up the place right and i'm like are you serious like you got you got rejected by the air force but you're just gonna completely whore out part of your film to coca-cola <laughs> and it, it it made no sense because in the grand scheme of this sort of ufo 
extraterrestrial story to work in this scene where the ETs go into the kitchen, mess up the fridge and the floor is covered in like meat and all this stuff. It, it doesn't make any sense. Then you see the, the doggy door flapping uh, because something had just crawled through it. And, and the kid looks around and looks, you know, at the doggy door and then kind of like, ah, <laughs> and like goes out back and then, the mom wakes up, looks out the window, is like, what the hell is going on, Billy? And he's like, <laughs> and runs off into the forest. And you're like, there's the doggy door flapping, you know, meat all over the floor. And you're just like, why? Why did he do this? Like, uh, it didn't need to be, it could have been done a totally different way to introduce some kind of, you know, foreign element coming into the house to see the kid or get its get his attention and then make him go outside, you know? I, I have an idea on this actually. Um other so, than product placement? Uh yeah, other than product placement. Why it would maybe be relevant to the film and narrative. Um it, it because uh maybe the fridge open is because everything's dark and you needed to light the area. Okay. So now you have an open fridge, it's a completely, you know, believable concept to, to light the area. Then you have the fact that the psychological fact that some creatures came in. So it's setting up the close encounter for the third kind. It's saying, hey, eventually you're going to see some some entities here. It's not just lights in the sky. So being comes in, you've got the directive call again to just have the light on. Uh, you could have just had a kitchen light on or a living room light on. And he messes up the pillows or something like that. But he chose a fridge. And because it is in the kitchen, a dog door accessible, that's pretty much, you know, where you keep that. You don't keep that on your front door. Uh, then maybe, just maybe. Uh, the entity, you know, this shows a real personal thing. People's fridges and your food supply, that's a very personal thing to any entity, any person, because that's your survival, right? So maybe uh, he shows that they can invade your most personal things and then run out the dog door, which is creepy in itself, because that says that the kid just missed it, that we just almost got a glimpse of this thing. Yeah, I mean, the this thing's scene... spinning, it's creepy the way it's even spinning, and then he's gone. Yeah, this scene is is more of like a creep factor for me. I yeah. felt like he was going for I want to add a horror element to this, you know, story. Well, this is M Night Shyamalan, you know, where they just show the reflection in the thing and you just see the hand. You know, it's real creepy because it's the evidence is there, it's thrown out, but it just happened, and that's why the kinetic element of the dog door is still swinging. It's so creepy. Apologies. Well, there's a aspect to this sequence that's perhaps not intentionally, but very um, sort of explicitly um, ufological, like accurately ufological, because although it seems out of place with the other um, uh, the other elements that we can sort of identify, identify from the pages of, of, of UFO literature in many of these other sequences, this one, like you say, is more like a horror uh, sequence, um, brings to mind it's what Spielberg would be doing a couple of years later in E.T., a few years later when he was making, uh, sorry, sorry, in, in uh, Poltergeist when he was making Across the Road from E.T. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. On, the same, on the same lot. And um, it's interesting because the, the ufological parallel here is, is that um, many, many, many cases of, of when people have had close encounters, like, for example, the one that Roy just had in the sequence that you just showed, um it would be quite it would be not at all unusual for a witness like roy then to go home and experience what we've what we could identify there as potentially as poltergeist activity yeah so, i noticed that um very common in this film like all the electronics toys cars, activating yeah. inside of his room and then when the ufos actually come to the house to abduct him Later on in the film, uh, you know, the most poltergeist scene out of that uh, that whole segment is when they zoom in on um, the ventilation grill on the floor and you see the screws slowly coming up mm -hmm. and then it pops open. She goes, leave us alone. <laughs> and she like throws the carpet <laughs> over top of some smoking vent. And you're like, ah, uh, like that'll do it. Yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> it was creepy, you know? And I remember yeah. seeing that when I was a kid and just being like, is this a horror movie? Like, what is this? You know, because, mm. like, just certain segments seem to be more of a horror movie than a science fiction about ufology. And uh, 
and and yeah, you really see the poltergeist uh, poltergeistiness, if that's a word, nailed it uh, yeah. in in these scenes, right? Um, you but, did, but yeah. To, uh, to uh, get, and I No, sorry, I was going to say, I, 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 do, and I, I just think it's interesting because um, I'm not sure if Spielberg was intentionally making reference to the poltergeist phenomena that overlap with UFO phenomena in so many reports, or if he was just doing that for pure cinematic, you know, chills. I'm, like, you know, I'm going to say, in, I'll say intentional just simply because of Jacques Vallée's um, uh, involvement in it. Because that was a big thing with him, right? I mean, he yeah, was talking yeah, about all point, the ancillary yeah. phenomena, uh, yeah. the strange phone calls, knocks at the doors, and then you yeah. see a UFO. And this is one of the challenges about people reporting this thing accurately. And that's why you're encouraged to report this stuff accurately, guys, mm -hmm. is to, because then you'll have all these other phenomena that are associated with it. And it's very important. And Jacques Vallée wrote about that extensively. And, of course, he has yeah. you know, a character in the movie, which may be why um, Spielberg decided to include it. I think it was pretty deliberate. Yeah, I'd say so, yeah. Let's go to another segment that, you know, is definitely very accurate to UFO history. Um, I'm not saying that poltergeists aren't, but let's say to um, what we've recorded in air traffic. Uh, so this is a pretty famous scene uh, where there's a, a near collision between, um, you know, the flight path of one of our commercial flights and something else that's not supposed to be there. And this actually happens right before uh, the scene we just saw where Roy, is it Roy is the little boy's name? Oh, uh, Billy, I think. Billy, <laughs> sorry. Right before Billy gets, uh, you know, the Coca-Cola advertisement. So, um, you know, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the fact that this is and and the really interesting thing about this scene um is that the pilots that are heard speaking with the air traffic controllers they say uh you know aries 33 aries 31 would you like to report on this uh would you like to report a ufo specifically they say this and they you hear the voice come back over the radio I uh, no, I prefer not to. I, I don't want to report. So, you know, this is the most relevant thing when it comes to air traffic phenomenon and UFOs. Uh, apparently, you know, if you look at the CBS or sorry, the um, 60 Minutes uh, report that came out recently, the one pilot says uh, when he's being interviewed that for two years, Every single day he was out in, in an aircraft, he would see and have a UFO uh, experience. But would he report it? No. And the reason they don't want to be, you know, deemed alone and then be grounded, right? They want to fly. Pilots places in the sky. And if they're talking about phenomenal things that can also even be verified by radar or not. I mean, that it, it, and what was so interesting about this scene in particular is because there's everybody standing around and they even initiated the question. They said, okay, do you want to report a UFO? And they said, no. And like, and the, well, there was a long pause and then a no. And then he said, well, do you want to report anything? And he's like, nope, I don't want to report anything. Because that's the thing, right? They would have deemed him mentally unfit to fly an aircraft and then he, he would have been grounded. So it's a it's a self-preservation type of a thing on their end to not not talk about it, especially if they're the only ones that saw it. But this was a room full of people that saw it, then inquired, hey, would you like to report this? Because it was crazy. And he said, nope, still didn't want to, even though yeah. people could corroborate the experience. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's it's that stigma is, um, has, you know, prevented countless, you know, pilots, uh, military, civilian, from uh, from ever ever talking about this and we know it's well you know from from word of mouth it's far more common you know for pilots to be sighting you know unknown objects in the sky than for people on the ground to be to be seeing them and um so yeah it's uh i think it's starting to change a little bit but even now i mean it's it's I don't, I don't, there's still going to be a huge stigma surrounding it i think uh, even now when it's still reported you know even when it's reported on the uh in the mainstream press uh, this, this past week there's still there's still a certain giggle factor around it even though they're um you know sort of talking about the imminent release of a potentially you know quite surprising um 
document or series of documents from the uh, from the Pentagon, it's still um, foreshadowed with a little a little nervous giggle, and uh, you know, although the X Files music's gone. Yeah, yeah, they love to play the the X Files music over this stuff. So if we're talking about the Pentagon, the Air Force, um, there was an interesting segment later on in the film uh, where they hold a press conference. And when they hold the press conference, they basically are specifically there to debunk the sightings that all these people have been having. And they show a specific photo and say, you know, people may think that this is a real flying saucer. And he picks up a, a little plate, a metal plate and says, actually, this is what you're seeing in this photo. But I recognize that photo. Um, is there some more relevance to that photo? Is this actually, um, you know, a real photo that Steven Spielberg has incorporated into the film that is of a real uh, famous UFO sighting that an experiencer had? To my knowledge, this is not a real photograph. This is something that they've mocked up for the film, but I think it's meant to be representative of or bring to mind photos like the McMinnville, Oregon um, photograph from the uh, late 40s, was it? I, can't even, I think it was maybe in the 50s. That's really bad that I don't know that. That's like a classic piece of UFO history that's just completely... It's all right. It's late, it's late in <laughs> London, or it's late in England. Sorry, man. But um, yeah, it's meant to it's meant to evoke um, some classic shots from from the early years of the phenomenon um, that were investigated and later debunked, or in some cases not by uh, by the Pentagon. This was a, you know again. So this scene here, uh, this is this is uh, it's authentically inspired. Well, and then Heineck, right? He was sitting there at a press conference and held up a picture of a yep. UFO, apparently. So, yeah, that's you get a lot of that. The famous swamp gas. So this is whole sequence, yeah. yeah, it's meant to get it's meant to call to mind. Yeah, like you say, Brandon, the uh, the swamp gas, infamous swamp gas in, um, uh, explanation explanation uh, for for you know a series of quite dramatic UFO sightings um, mm -hmm. that were taking place in a small town. And Heineck shows up on the orders of the Air Force, and he has to debunk. At all costs you know and so <laughs> yep. he knew that it was uh it was really pushing it and um his reputation suffered a bit for it did he ever retract that statement that uh the ufos everybody experienced at that point were reflections off the water of swamp gas light something like i don't sure if he ever formally retracted it but he did later acknowledge that he was instructed to say all of this stuff um regardless of whether he believed it or not and obviously he knew that that incident was not you know that was yeah. there, he knew how he knew how ridiculous that looked there was an interview with him it was very grainy horrible footage nobody's respecting the audio quality uh they're just walking around plates are smashing and stuff they're in a but it's it's a it's a great interview with him on a couch at some just guy's house and in that he did say that yes he was strongly encouraged to talk about that they could be explained away by natural phenomena uh or just misidentification of aircraft and also he said in that, because uh, I think this was after he'd already formed SUFOs, uh, he was saying that, um, yeah, but a lot of them couldn't be explained by natural means. Um, he, he just had some really interesting comments in that one particular interview. I'll see if I can dig it up and I'll send it to you guys. Yeah. And, and you know, what Heineck, you know, really believed about the phenomenon, his personal beliefs about it were far more uh, radical than, than anything he publicly said, um, you know, on a, on a public platform. And, um, yeah, he was deeply interested in the abduction side of it as well and um uh yeah fascinating guy and uh but yeah who obviously whose influence can be felt throughout this film really favorite quote of uh Heinex was if you want to see a flying saucer goose the waitress <laughs> that was something he actually said that's hilarious <laughs> yeah poor, as a, poor oh, waitresses out there yeah as a, i wanted to there's a correction by the way i said we said that uh the uh, the little kid's name is billy it's barry see he's barry. so forgettable i mean he's yeah. just so forgettable and that's that's a real tragedy here we remember the coke <laughs> um just forgettable yeah so just bad just bad casting brain. that's all it is so in you terms know, of the family dynamics in this film i did want to quickly talk about that um you know because we talk about the abduction phenomenon and um are how, you being abducted now well i just just heard you whipped like, around like my, you were hearing something. I just heard my Shiba Inu sneeze here, so I'm like, "What's 
going on back here. But um, I'll give you a, a little cameo from him later on. Cool. But uh, so in family terms dynamics. of fa family dynamics, right? Like in this film, the family is the most annoying part of the whole film. You don't care about his family. You barely care. Well, you care probably more about um, the single mom and, and Barry because, you know, they're separated. It's really terrifying how that goes down. Poltergeist, aliens, all that stuff. But what really bothers me is when they show scenes like this and you've got all this noise happening. The kid is smashing the legs off of this the daughter's doll in the background. They're asking about what they're going to do on the weekend. The kids met the kid to Richard Dreyfus's uh, right is annoying the hell out of him. He doesn't want it. Like, it's like he's totally checked out from his own family. And it's kind of sad if you watch it, you know, with, with some empathy, uh, which most viewers of the time probably were, were like, what does the word empathy even mean? But uh, you know, He's like walking around with shaving cream at one point. His wife slams it into his face. Like, you're not talking about these UFOs anywhere. You're not investigating this. Like, totally putting the brakes on his uh, interest in this phenomenon. He's been burned at that point. Um, what I found very interesting and, and the way that I related how the family is so annoying and he's willing to walk away from the family, just abandon his family to walk on a craft at the end of the film and go to the stars. I feel like this is probably the most threatening part of the film that NASA would have read when they looked at the script because the family is the center of our society. You know what I mean? The family is the most important thing that keeps us together, keeps us uh, running in, in sort of idealistic terms. If UFOs showed up en masse, they started landing all around, you know, uh, our different countries around the world. And we all of a sudden became psyched about this. Like literally our minds were invaded by this new presence and we weren't interested in the systems that have been in place for so long in the past, which is the family, religion, uh, economics, you know, going to work and working nine to five to make ends meet. If we were not attracted to this anymore because our new attraction was, let's go see what this, this new phenomenon is. Let's see these people that have landed on our lawns and, and our, you know, inviting us to join them. Um, I think that's really destabilizing. And I think that's um, partly why the family was so chaotic. Maybe there's something to do with Steven Spielberg and his views on family and why he made Richard Dreyfuss's family so annoying. Um, but, you know, you're, you're watching his family fall apart in that's one thing that kind of lags. You, you, you talked about earlier, Robbie, that there's some parts of the film that kind of lag and you're like kind of over it. You're watching it and you're like, when are we going to get on to the next part? It's all the family scenes. It's where Richard Dreyfus is shoveling dirt through, you know, a wheelbarrow into his window of his kitchen. And you just see his kid about to like throw a tantrum because his his eldest child is become uh, realizing his son is like his father's losing his mind and his wife is checking out. She's saying, you know, this guy's nuts. He cares more about UFOs than he cares about me. Um, it's sad. And uh, you, it does invoke empathy for a few folks, but I feel like the way that it was um orchestrated on the on screen it actually makes you more annoyed and just wants you to get the family out of there so you can get back to the like <laughs> ufos and suspense of the film and by the time those scenes move out of the way and richard dreyfus has you know uh jumped in a car and driven out to uh devil's peak in wyoming you're like all right 
it's back. You know, everything's looking good again and it's fun and it's suspenseful. What's your take on that? What do you think the family uh, sort of dynamic has to do with, first of all, ufology and um, how, you know, it affects us, how families are important to who we are as human beings. And then what's happening in the film and how the family just doesn't, it doesn't make you feel good in the film. Well, okay. So, um, in order, Robbie. <laughs> um, so first of my first thoughts on, on this are seeing an interview with Spielberg that he, that was shot with him on the set of Saving Private Ryan. Um, looking back on Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and he's being interviewed about this um, on the set of Private Ryan, and he, he says that he feels that Close Encounters is the film that most dates him in the sense that he could never imagine making a film today where he his main protagonist just calmly leaves his entire family and to never see them again like to, to just get onto a spaceship and not know what's because that was the, that was the vision of a of a of a dreaming kid you know of like of an idealistic um little kid and that's essentially who made the movie that that boy was sort of still present in everything Spielberg was doing when he made that movie and that's why it comes out like it does um a bit messy but like whoa <laughs> and um and uh so the family thing in there like yeah that means at the time you know Spielberg he didn't have a family when he made that when he made, made that movie and so they were just used as a, a plot device um something like you say they were an obstacle they are they were the, they're the sort of the protagonist almost in the they sorry the uh the, the antagonist in the film almost the fact of the family alongside the, the the pesky military um because they're the obstacles to him getting to go who knows where um this is the other family sides of things you could talk about uh within with, with reference to ufology and the significance of family and um, one of the things that I don't think Spielberg did really explore in this, although he may have, and I may be completely wrong about this, is um, the links between abductees across generations, um, which wasn't really something, again, that was certainly not something that was that was being identified at that point, not even within ufology, really. He did address this in recent, in, uh, I think it, was in the 2000s taken. he had taken the tv taken, show yeah. taken and that's yeah. basically the, whole thing, the yeah. best part of the whole show i watched the whole show and was like when is this going to get good and it was like oh okay the abduction phenomenon and genetic lineage being the abductees yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah so and I, I taken was great i thought taken was was really impressive um and very again as fantastical as it is fairly you know decently rooted in in ufological history or at least you know U U ufo law shall we say so um we're kind of at our one hour mark now uh i'd say uh for anybody who's listening or watching please if you like what you've heard so far and and seen uh definitely hit the subscribe uh button and uh you know, also uh, the all notifications. So whenever we have a new episode, you can see the next film we're reviewing as well as our new guests and, and so on and so forth. We'll be uploading stuff to YouTube as well as Patreon. For those of you who want to follow us on Patreon and support us there, um, we'll have the full two hours there and we're going into the next hour now. So thanks so much for joining us. It was it was awesome. It was like yeah, just it was just really nice to get away, change the scenery for a bit because yeah. we work from home, so we're we're here just twenty four seven. Like yeah, mm -hmm. you went to Rentalsham, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing, man. Um, I wish I wish that was in my backyard. That'd be amazing. It was good. It was eerie. It was like an hour and a half walk through, like a, a sort of a signposted walk through the woods, 
Um, uh, Did you feel you, like something was watching you the whole time? Um, it was. It was just over. The, there was virtually no one there. Like, and we didn't see anyone really for the whole time. So, and there was no one there at the actual landing site um, or site of the event or whatever. What actually, whatever actually happened there. <laughs> um, and um, but it was creepy. It's eerie and uh, loads of strong military sort of presence. You can feel. There's barbed wire everywhere, um, lots of closed off sort of underground bunkers and things like that, and tunnels that lead underground and cool. military signs everywhere. But it was, you know, it was, I, I, I'd never been there before, so it was nice to, to sort of finally get there after all these years, you know? Yeah. Amazing. So welcome back, everybody. Uh, this is the extra hour that is going towards our Patreon followers, uh, you know, my guy right here, Brandon, other way, other to way, the back. Other way. other way. There it is. I was going to say, I'm going um, to lean in like this, and we look like a Depeche Mode album. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyways, so we are back. We are talking with Robbie Graham from Silver Screen Saucers, uh, you know, author of Silver Screen Saucers. And what's your second book, Robbie? UFOs Reframing the Debate. Okay. And... The film that we've reviewed for the first episode is Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Uh, we're covering some of Steven Spielberg's uh, amazing interest and uh, sort of fact-based uh, expose into the UFO phenomenon through uh, the Hollywood lens. And then, um, Robbie, why don't you just kind of explain to people that are listening, what hyper reality is to you? <laughs> uh, hyper reality is a cultural concept, essentially. Um, and it refers to an inability of consciousness to distinguish between something that is real and something that is fiction or fantasy. And um, I, so it's a it's a cultural theory that was sort of just that was sort of um, thrown around by a bunch of philosophers um, in the twentieth century, including Jean Baudrillard, and um, and it ties in with theories about you know the act of looking and the act of spect and sort of the 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 uh, the process of spectacle and basically hyper reality in the context of ufos is applicable because i i i see cinema's relationship to ufos as being a really frustrating one um to witness because so often i will see or hear like if a, a ufo conference for example and some author or experiencer will say oh we're, we're talking to some hollywood producers and they're going to make and they're going to make a um a, a, a movie about our case or about this particular case or they're going to adapt the book as a movie and and then everyone will see it and everyone will take it seriously i'm thinking well that's not what movies do that's not the effect that movies have on, on the popular consciousness if you've if you've lived uh it's it's like you know if you, if you've had a close encounter experience and someone from hollywood wants to turn that into a movie do you really think that the people who watch that movie are going to believe more in the experience that you've had because there's been a movie about it or do you think that they actually might on the contrary believe it slightly less for the same reason because there's been a movie made about it and the answer points to the effect of cinema what 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 is the effect of cinema how does how does it um impact our and shape our reality really because cinema simultaneously actualizes and fictionalizes i think whatever it depicts and um it masks the underlying reality on which the movie is based so the movie itself the product 
Is this making any sense whatsoever? This is making You're doing any great. Sense yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatsoever. It <laughs> is. It is. Keep um, going. The, the, so the, a, a movie is, is a magical thing. I mean, a, a, movie making is an act of magic. I mean, it's, it still astonishes me how hundreds of people who are involved in the making of one single movie, hundreds of people, hundreds of different visions and different lives in this whirlwind of apparent chaos and the end product through all of these visions, all of these hands comes out as a approximately two hour gleaming piece of fiction that moves in front of our eyes and that can be anything that we can imagine or that we could want. It's, it's astonishing. And there's so many artistic visions that all go into this one, what appears to be in the final product, a unified single vision, if it's done right, you know, if, if it's done right. And um, uh, so, so movie making is magic, I think. And, um, and I think the, the effect that it has on us is, is, is magic as well. The, the, the products, the, the movies themselves, for lack of a better term, is magic. Because we struggle, I think, increasingly with knowing, with, with being able to tell the difference between fact and fantasy. But more so, I think that we care less about the difference between fact and fantasy than we used to. Um, I think the, the boundary between the two is, is blurrier than it's ever been. I'm not sure if that's good or bad, to be honest with you. I used to think it was bad, but I'm not so sure anymore. Um, but with with uh, an example I think I use in the book of hyperreality in relation to UFOs is um, uh, we talk, so for example, the, the Roswell movie from 1994, this is based on the, on the there's a TV movie made for HBO with Carl McLaughlin and Martin Sheen's got a small cameo role in it. And this was a film that was a science fiction, ostensibly a science fiction film released in the era of the X-Files. Um, but it was based on a real event, the Roswell incident of 1947, which was still unexplained, you know, really essentially unexplained to this day, despite what the Air Force say is an unexplained incident, but it's a, it was the first ever feature length dramatic treatment of the Roswell incident in 1994, but it, it comes off essentially as a sci-fi movie. Um, what is the effect of that movie? Why was it even made? So that, so again, you like, it was made because the man who made it, Paul Davids, the guy who wrote the film and produced the film had several years prior had his own ufo experience that changed his life and turned him into a believer he witnessed a, fly, a flying saucer from his home with his daughter quite close up probably within 500 feet away um and that set him on this journey to discover what was what roswell was all about he ended, and then he wanted to educate the public thought well, how can i bring this subject to the attention of the public well i'll make a movie about it and he did just that, and it did bring it to the attention of the public, and it pushed it really massively into into popular debate. Um, but at the same time, it came to in the popular consciousness. I think for those who are not initiated into into this weird world of ufology, all it does is it just it's just another movie with a big alien head and flying saucer and area you know even had a glimpse of area 51 at that time and a, first... and a body on a uh body on a board. slab right and a cadaver yeah. on it right which I've and these seen are all that, that sort of... i've seen that photo like used so many times in right ufology people claiming a... that that was a real autopsy uh video right. or photo from area 51 and i'm like that's from the movie yeah. like and, yeah. and that's the crazy thing. That's also the hyper hyper reality there is that um, because the Hollywood fiction piece becomes the predominant story, people lose sight of the fact and the fiction becomes fact for a lot of the people that believe in this lore and it, it, it abducts the subject, so to speak. Nice. That's right. That's right. Um and it's the idea of, um, you know, the cartographer in the ancient world creating a map of the world so detailed that the map itself consumes the world because it's mm. so detailed, right? So that the, mm. and no one knows now whether it's the map or the world that they're 
standing on or looking at and does it make any difference because it's it's the same thing it's like um that that real ufology real ufo law and ufology has almost been consumed by hollywood narratives you know um it's been re replaced um uh like like you know like a pod person in the thing and um so you know there's there's numerous examples you could point to um uh of of how hollywood basically uh latches onto a fact-based ufological idea um concept case whatever event, then event in history right event or event in history not yeah, outside of ufology and then so i think I, I talked to you darcy about the idea that um if i were to say to anyone listening here what is the first thing you think of when you hear the word titanic i'll bet that kate winslet and leonardo dicaprio are not far from being conjured in your mind along with a big you know <laughs> uh epic shot of the titanic going down in, in james cameron's movie you can't really not think of the james cameron movie when someone says titanic can you is it is it even possible to, to think of it without yeah, thinking I think of the, the conspiracy theory that it didn't get hit by an iceberg and that um it was just a ploy to let the federal reserve go through because three guys that died on it were supposed to vote against that and then uh jp morgan i believe or rockefeller they stayed and canceled last minute so it was actually a sabotage mission to wow. uh alleviate the fed didn't, but I've it didn't work because those guys died. <laughs> oh, it's such a cool concept. And they're actually mixing the Titanic and another boat up. I forget what the I forget what the name of the other boat is, but they, they've shown pictures of both, and the windows are a dead giveaway. It wasn't the Titanic that sank. It was this other boat. It's fascinating. Oh my God. So anyway, I think we'll the have... furthest thing I think is the James Cameron thing. I think about the conspiracy theory. Okay, if we take Brandon out of the equation. Right. And... right. <laughs> this is anomaly. <laughs> But uh, hey, hyper reality. Here's a scene that's kind of hyper re real, right? Like we have had yeah. the Air Force come forward and and debunk UFO events in history. Am I right? Yeah. Who was? It? Damn it. Who was that? I can't think. Um, of it that was in 1952, I believe. Uh, um, well, and it was right after the flyover of the of the, of the Capitol. Yes. Okay, yeah. which is yeah, also. Yeah, but you... I meant to point out that that's what that radar scene reminded me of. It was seen for two nights. Sanford, thank you. Yes, way to go, yeah. Robbie. General Sanford, and that's then what this, this this scene reminded this, me of. It. This scene is hyper real because this is something that's commonly reported by pilots and Air Force personnel, and you know, even apparently the Navy. USOs are a big phenomenon uh, out at sea. So, you know, this is a very early example of hyper reality where something has happened in history it's being written into fiction now and we're supposed to believe well which is well our mind is is going to go is this real or is this just hollywood and it's like actually a real love yeah exactly people get Does that confused a lot that's well that's an example of hyper realistic where our brains can't distinguish between the truth there's people that think that the strippers love them yeah it's just sad <laughs> or or hooters man those girls broke my heart well the hooters girls you're, you're a very needy customer so yeah um so let's go to an interesting little uh scene here i absolutely love this scene you know i've, I've said quite a few negative things about the film so far and i i don't want people to think out there that i don't like Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I love it. This is also one of these amazing groundbreaking films that made me very attracted to the UFO subject at a young age. Um, when Richard Dreyfus is, is caught after he and his new girlfriend uh, break into the Devil Peaks, uh, Devil's Tower, Tower. area, mm -hmm. And they start to, they've infiltrated this area. They've been taken. They're being interrogated by, uh, what's his name? La... Jacques Vallée. Well, Jacques Vallée is the Pepe realistic. Pepe Le Pew. Pepe Le Pew. Uh, no, what's his name, Robbie? Sorry, in, the, in, this, in this sequence, the actor or the character? The character. Um, oh, God. <laughs> um... I'll, I'll look. I'll look, look home. I've got, Lacombe. I've got it. I've got Claude it. Lacombe. 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 Yeah, Lacombe. Yeah. Lacombe. 
Because so I, I thought you meant um, Bob, is... Bob Balaban's character for some reason. No, what's, what's Bob ba Balaban, he's good. But, he you know, we've got Richard Dreyfus, and they basically are going over the abduction. They're, they're doing a questionnaire of um, what an abductee would experience. They're, they're saying, you know, what, you know, ha have you experienced this? Have you had a incredible uh, encounter with something that's unexplained is pretty much the last question they ask him. Uh, they said, have you been having migraines and headaches? Before that, he says yes to that. He says no to the first question. And then when he realizes these guys know exactly what's been happening to me, he does this really clever little smile. And he says, who are you people? And this, the scene, all he keeps saying is, who are you people? Who are you people? And I think this is A, a hyper real scene because the Air Force, for example, interviewed Betty and Barney Hill. They they were quite interested in that abduction case. Um, and many other abductees, most likely, they were trying to debrief after their uh, experiences. And this is what we're seeing here. We're seeing a closed room interrogation of an experiencer. Uh, so this is a hyper real thing in the UFO phenomenon in, in, in terms of history and events that have actually happened. Uh, but in terms of Richard Dreyfuss's performance, it's like hilarious because it goes from being a character who is extremely serious. You see the look on his face. He's saying, who are you people? And they continue with their questioning and he's saying, who are you people? And then he says at the end with this cheeky little smile, who are you people? And it, it's kind of like this way of showing his range and showing what an interesting, you know, person he is in terms of his interest of, of this UFO phenomenon that's been happening to him. So uh, what do you think in terms of this scene and um, what's your favorite part of the film? I guess I, this is my favorite part of the film. Um, so on oh, my favorite part of the film, um, my, I think, I mean, uh, it's cliched, but I mean, it's gotta be the mothership at the end, but also it's gotta be the, um, some of the earlier scenes, I think just after the, I think that the initial, one of those initial, uh, encounters they have on the road, uh, where it flies out over the, uh, over the valley and the police have been in hot pursuit and um they just sort of stood there in the silent night with these things just sort of hanging in the sky it's all just so eerie and really sort of um rings very authentic um when sort of you know compared to how many you know to, to, the, to the to the grassroots reports um especially that have come in from around america over the decades it you know the, it's it's really it's a labor of love and, and spielberg just it just oozes <laughs> oozes ufos doesn't it <laughs> mm -hmm. absolutely what about um, you brandon but, uh i like my my favorite scene of course is the end uh the music the exchange the interaction the communication in that way and that it shows that music is like a universal you know it's it's based on mathematics and it's a universal kind of an understanding that we can all communicate with whether you can know the same language or not that is a language in itself right it's a form of communication i really enjoyed that i one of my favorite things about the movie in general was just the the historical references to the uh, reports that were all throughout the film. So the uh, opening scene with the pilots that went missing, which is ancillary phenomena, it's a, a abduction slash uh, time slips slash all of that stuff. Uh, then with the uh, flyover at the Capitol, that's a nod to the uh, press conference by Sanford, as well as, you know, uh, Hynek's press conference, the swamp gas thing, uh, the demystification of it, uh, the attempt to demystification of it uh, by the government, as well as um, just like I said, the themes throughout. And then I'm I thought of Project Serpo right there at the end, and uh, I don't know if we want to talk about that at all. But that's kind of that I that I bust your cherry on that, Dosh. You look no, upset. that's my cherry has been busted a while ago. Um, I think that's awesome. I think Project Serpo is a huge story. Um, you know, people may know of 
uh, the story in the UFO field, but basically uh, it, it became a really prominent story when Bill Ryan from Project Camelot uh, started interacting with this anonymous figure on the Project Camelot chat forum, uh, their website. Project Camelot is this website where many people that believed in UFOs and all kinds of crazy stuff uh, would go to see interviews from people that are apparently whistleblowers and stuff like this. And this guy who was writing into the message board uh, was posing as a informant, somebody who uh, experienced, you know, going off planet, being part of an exchange program. And um, kind of at the end of this film, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing people that the aliens have handpicked Richard Dreyfuss's character and all these other poor suckers that uh, flew off on the helicopter or got gassed by the Air Force on the way to the top of the Devil's Tower. Um, you know, they were handpicked by the aliens. These are the, the, the good ones, I'd say, the noble savages of us all, the, the, uh, the best, uh, maybe the, the most modest mankind they could have, they could uh, capture and maybe analyze. they just all had garbage families like Dreyfus. Yeah, so maybe they're like, they were oh, all just he won't tired be missed. Families and you can tell like, he's ready to all. get out of here. He comes willingly, you know. Yeah, yeah, it could be that. That too. was the requirement, right? Yeah, requirement is that your your family is an obstacle, not an enjoyment. <laughs> yeah, um, is your home life garbage. Well, come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. I think Project Serpo, which uh, a lot of people believe Richard Doty was actually in charge of um, spreading in the UFO community, was a direct ripoff of the ending of this film, which was this uh, fictionalized um, story that R Richard Doty posed as an anonymous figure. Uh, some researchers linked the IP of the emails that were coming to Richard to Bill Ryan, sorry, that were um, supposedly the trail of where the, the story originated as being Richard Doty's. And Richard Doty used to work, he was a man in black. He used to work for the government, literally disinforming people like Paul Benowitz and, and the like to uh, take the UFO subject to the masses, to the UFO believers out there and uh, misinform and, and steer them in a different direction than the possibly the truer side of things, the truer story. Um, what do you think about that, Robbie? Uh, I, I talk about Richard Doty um, quite a bit in my own work, um, and I look at the impact and influence that the disinformation campaign, which he was at the forefront of, um in the 1980s really shaped popular ufological belief um during that time time frame and and i think it's been very significant and very very successful and i think that a lot of the core story as we understand it today about ufos and the government's relationship to the phenomenon and reverse engineering of technologies and treaties with aliens and all this kind of stuff all of that it tra traces back to a handful of disinfo operatives from the late 70s and early 80s out of the Office of Special Investigations in the Air Force. And um, uh, we believe what we what they wanted us to believe for whatever reasons they had at the time. And um, I think it's remarkably successful. Again, I encourage people to to look into this for themselves because if you're going to have any hope of understanding what's currently unfolding with all of this pentagon stuff and the ufos or uaps as, a, as they've now been rebranded um you, you've got to, to to look into your history of ufo disinformation um and just general um history of of ufos and and washington and the pentagon generally really because um yeah, so I, 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 I just think that, that, that disinformation continues to play a very, very strong role in um, in popular ufological debate. It shapes the debate, I think. And I think people, it's such a religious community uh, in the sense of like the, the UFO belief is, is 
got a strong religious aspect to it. And I say that as someone who's experienced that directly and sort of come out of it. Um, so I get it. Like it's about salvation from a higher power, which is why that belief is so strong. And so why people want, want it to be something that's tangible and biological and technological so that we can all put our hands on it and know that we were right all along and that um, there's proof that you know something that's provable to the to the naysayers and the skeptics and that does have some chance of um, bettering us as a species and moving us forward and helping us to evolve but again I think that's the extraterrestrial hypothesis and I think um, that that for whatever reason that hypothesis has been pushed by um, disinf disinformation operatives including Richard Doty and I think it's a simplification of the phenomenon as reported um, you know across time and culture it's far stranger it would seem far stranger than just that and um, and so you know part of the disinformation may seem, I mean because it's no longer just about disinformation it's about perception management and it's just about managing how people perceive the phenomenon people everyone you know most people believe that something's going on by this point um but you so you don't want it's, you, it's, it's pointless to try to make them believe otherwise but you can control to some extent or influence how they perceive the phenomenon you know and um there's a lot of room there to shape belief for all sorts of agendas that we could only speculate at so i think that you know people are taking things at face value from people um who are new players on this scene who um who certainly shouldn't be taken at face value at all um because they're they've come from the intelligence world um and if you and history repeats itself and you know it's just simple as that yeah, Robbie and I share this skepticism about the information coming out right now. We we kind of have an optimistic hesitation about what they're going to say. And the same with the Richard Doty figure, uh, who, you know, if he comes out and admits that he's been lying the whole time and infiltrating everybody for a narrative or to push a psyop or a psychological operation, why the hell can we believe anything he says at all, period, from that point? Like, even no, about can't. him being a disinformation agent and coming we out with a particular narrative, right? No, we it's can't, just, but we still do. We still do because people like Fox Mulder said want to believe. And it is true, and um, yeah, it's, it's not. And it's not that I don't believe the thing. Well, I, what, what's bothering me? Well, we're, we're going off. We're going way off off tangent here. So, so we're going no, off go, on for tangent. It. Okay. go for it. It's okay. Go for it. Um, yeah, no. What's what's bothering me about a lot of the recent um, coverage in the in the media on this Pentagon stuff with with the UAP report that's forthcoming? is that the language that's being used by the key players who currently pop up uh, on all of these platforms, the likes of Christopher Mellon and Luis Elizondo and the uh, lineup of military pilots, uh, of Navy pilots who've been given authorization to talk. Because don't forget, all of these people have been given authorization from the top to talk. This isn't some, some sort of, you know, grassroots kind of rogue initiative that's that's been spearheaded by Elizondo independently of this, that and the other. Everything you see here that's been happening since 2017, 2016, including even before the Pentagon stuff happened, even back to Tom DeLong, all of this was was a long time in the planning. And it's been engineered to make it look organic, like it's almost like a you know, and it's none of these people would be talking if they you don't just suddenly if they weren't the, given the permission it, yeah, it's the most sensitive the it's the most sensitive topic in 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 the government it's just, it always has been in our world's and, history yeah and if in the world's history and if they're not if they're not being given express permission to discuss this on the world across the world's media of a sustained piece um sustained period of time if they'd not been if that had not come from the top none of those we, we would never have heard anything those people had to say even if they That's wanted right. to say it, simple as yeah, that. It's been it still would have been this... considered a conspiracy move on type thing. Well, it's been so released do you at believe... this time for do... a specific reason. Yeah. And yes. Still... The qu That's the question. The question is why now? Why yeah. now? Yeah, what we're waiting to... to find out what the true motive is. Well, I mean, we won't uh... find out the true motive. We will never find out the true motive. And you if anyone, think... th no. 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 And well, one of the hints we have like for this was Kathleen Martin's uh, 
report of what Heine, or, uh, Von Braun said on his deathbed to where there were three no, that was ways. Carol Rawson. Was it Carol Rawson? Carol Rawson. What did I say? Kathleen Martin. She's my apologies. Tea. Carol Rawson. That's right. Okay. Uh, what she said about um, Von Braun's deathbed confession was is that there were three ways that they were going to kind of institute the new world order or more control, restrict your liberties and your movements and things like that. Go to a cashless society, just globalization. And one of them was terrorism, which they've already tried that. Um, then the other was a fake alien or asteroid uh, event. And then the other one was a fake alien uh, invasion which they could use with either technology that we've reverse engineered. Because the big thing on this, too, that a lot of people are missing, I know you guys aren't, but if the aliens wanted to come down and were the threat that they're about to probably present to us that they are, or that they say that they are, they could have done this a long time ago. I don't think it's oh. that's, it's a perception management angle to have threat in a state of emergency and then martial law. And this is one vein of thought that you could go down. Yeah, I mean, you, you just got to look at the, the other language that's being used by all of these spokespeople. Um, so when I see, say people like, uh, like Chris, Chris Mellon and Elizondo and the Navy guys, and um, this is, they're, they're, they're not saying anything they're not meant to say. Just keep that in mind for anyone, anyone who's watching that they're, they're not saying anything that I'm meant to say or, or have not been authorized to say. And um, uh, it's, I just I'm not quite sure where they're going with it, but what worries me is the language that they're using, which is um, consistently tied up in the idea of threat and hostility and vulnerability, yep. and all wrapped up in militaristic language. And the only debate now that's being had around this new, seemingly new subject in the in the public mind, it's all being filtered through the lens of of militarism. Where are the philosophers and scientists in the on CNN and Fox News alongside, alongside you know um, Luis Elizondo, mm -hmm. and uh, why is it's, this being yeah. discussed? It's this politics. Is, this is, it's politics right. too, because like Christopher it's, Mellon, you know, right, politics, right, right. It's all politics and military, and like where, what, where, where are the, where's the philosophical, theological discussions that could be had um, surrounding this? This, it's it's being monopolized completely by the military as 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 it would be it makes sense that it is because it's been con because of all of the, you know the subject has been controlled by the military essentially and, and increasingly by corporate powers you know over the past several decades but um that's worrying because if you want if you want transparency on the most important issue in the world why do you expect that transparency from an institution which is inherently <laughs> non-transparent? Yeah, secretive. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, and rogue. You know what I find? You know what I find transparent as well. Segway coming at you is the uh, Devil's Tower in the movie. How it is actually? Um, people say that it is an old petrified tree stump. It's pretty cool. Oh yes. How it I've ties into that. this I've idea. Heard that. But yeah, they looked I've at the molecular that. structure on the outside of it. And I think Native American lore was that it's a giant bear that was climbing up to get. Anyway, uh, it's an interesting correlation to uh, segue us back into the movie here. I was looking I was looking for that last night, last night to try and work into this. And I was just like, ah, that's one yeah, of you, my, you my buddy that said that once. But it's so interesting. Um, but there's a bunch of examples of stuff like that. It's just petrified wood, which would no. mean that it's a giant tree, which would mean that the earth is, in fact, flat. We all know this, Darcy. Go ahead. Uh, no. No, it's not what I'm going to do. <laughs> we live on a sphere surrounded by spheres. Anyway, we're not the doing four, this. So my forehead is oh, we live in a simulation. Thank you. It's, it would be uh, flat in a simulation is all I'm saying. Simulation is cool, but It'd be your um, map, right? Yeah, not really. <laughs> I think the simulation so, is actually being run by the military industrial complex and ooh, political deep. entities. I think that is simulation orchestration not like flat earth projected sky mm -hmm. projected space that that that's that's where to me conspiracy theory gets lazy and stupid because you're giving up physics you're giving up hardcore science which actually exists like we've made a lot of the things around us based on tangible science 
So why would we throw it out? You know, a lot of physics and astrophysics are theories based on theories based on theories. They still don't understand gravity completely, but we're not doing the flat earth thing. We'll do it in another episode. Okay. Yeah, Go we'll on. do it another episode. Back to the we'll movie. Buddy on. But um, back <laughs> yeah. to the movie. You know what? I'm going to bring up another little uh, thing that I found interesting. And, and I don't know how you guys find this character. He's uh, really become prominent again in the UFO um, venue, the UFO realm. Uh, Bob Lazar. So why is Bob Lazar related to Close Encounters of the Third Kind? In recent years with Jeremy Corbell releasing the film Lazar, um, which has hit Netflix and and a whole bunch of other uh, platforms, one of the major selling points that he presented that Bob Lazar couldn't have made up uh, that could prove that he actually worked on this, um, you know, clandestine research project trying to reverse engineer the propulsion system for the sports model, this uh, captured ancient aliens uh, disc that the United States uh, had in their possession, apparently. One of the things that's the smoking gun to his testimony is that there was a, a handprint finger bone scanner okay and jeremy corbell has said it so many times he said look this finger bone scanner is actually a real technology and it wasn't actually acknowledged or shown to the public until like like after his testimony of this technology existing now i'm going to point something out bob lazar hit the scene in May of 1989, okay? That's when he was on KT, George, Knapp. George Knapp's KL in the back of a van, AS. All darkened yeah. out. Right? Mm-hmm. And, and started his testimony on this subject. Now, in this film, there's a shot of a research facility which looks very NASA like, probably why. Um, Steven Spielberg wanted NASA involved in this film to make this scene even more realistic looking. They probably could have gotten a better radar dish. Um, Just before the scientists that are working on trying to figure out what the music or the code is that's been hitting their radio telescopes around the world uh, stands for, the scientists have to get through a security door. And the very exact same technology that apparently never really hit the, the the television screen or was you know out in the public is exemplary here it is this is the scene look at that right there hmm. what is he putting his hand on and if you look at the design of this technology this is exactly what bob lazar said he had to use to get through a security door when he was working at the S4 facility. So Hmm. who's to say that he did not watch this scene in 1977 or sometime after that, leading up to 1989, and then say, this is what we use to get through a security door at the S4 facility. And, you know, I, I could pull up a picture, but people can just Google finger bone scanner, Bob Lazar, and they'll see a photo of this exact same uh, device, but this was featured in Close Encounters of the Third Kind. But the technology so, really does exist. So it, it probably does existed exist, back but, in the 70s. But who's to say that that isn't? No, no, no. I'm with you. you. Know, a I'm prop with you. Based off of something, or maybe maybe Steven Steven Spielberg actually got this technology for the set. You never know. I'm just saying that this has existed on the screen before Bob Lazar you know, testified that this is what he used to swipe through a door. It might be the predictive programming, which they find in movies all the time, where they will tell you exactly what's going on ahead of the public sector actually even knowing about it. And what's the theory? It's either anywhere, the number changes constantly, that it's anywhere between 50 to 100 years more advanced in the military and in black projects than what's released into the private sector. So that would make sense, though, if something like that existed back then. I'm not saying it disproves or proves Bob Lazar's account, but... It might be another element of predictive programming where they pepper something out into the into you know 
the public sector for everybody to say, oh, look, what's cool. You know, we have this. But then in real life, they couldn't see that in their real lives. But it was inactive duty uh, over at Area 51, perhaps. You know, it might be. What do you think? Do you think Bob Lazar is the real deal? I think Bob Lazar is the real deal. Um, I, uh, I've written, again, I've written fairly extensively about it and um, followed the Bob Lazar thing for years very, very closely, watched every interview I think he's ever given multiple times, read everything he's ever said, you know, to the extent that that's possible. Um, and I've, I believe that Bob Lazar is telling the truth as he believes it for the most part. Um, but the truth that he's telling is, is not, is not a, an accurate reflection of the events as they happened mm. because he's been messed with because he was given shots multiple times during his time on the base. He told Jacques, Jacques Vallée, he was given, he was injected with strange colored serum in his, in his arm uh, multiple times. And, um, Jeremy Corbell did not include that in his documentary hmm. <laughs> for obvious reasons. Yeah. Um, because it calls into question his what reality. Yeah. yeah. He could have been mm-hmm. taking some kind of hallucinogenic for all yeah. I could tell. They, they also clearly were messing with stagecraft with, with, with Lazar. So what happened? I, I'm, I'm very convinced. I would, I'm very convinced that, I, I could only speculate as to the agendas, but it seems fair to assume that one of the agendas behind this was related to psychological warfare against the Soviet Union at the time, or possibly other foreign enemy nations, but certainly the Soviet Union during the Cold War uh, in the 80s. Lazar was selected, psychologically profiled. He fit the profile of someone who was scientifically fairly gifted like he he had a very good brain um but he was had a spotty personal and business history involvement with brothels and various sort of other illegalities which means that he's very easy to discredit like that right and you choose people you don't choose people with impeccable nobel prize credentials you choose people who 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 can exploit understand what what you what they need to understand but who you can discredit at the drop of a hat. This is classic, just yeah. intelligence stuff, you know, this is spycraft. And um, and so they bring him in and they sh- everything they show him is just for him. It's like, the, it's like the Truman Show, but just for Bob Lazar. They take him there and everything he sees is all for his benefit. Hmm. And he even picks up on that fact in his own testimony. He knows there's something not right here. He he says he sees he looks around the base and he sees posters around the base saying with a picture of a grey alien head on them saying they're here. Yeah, why would you do that? Why at a top secret military base have you got funny little movie posters with grey alien heads saying they're here on who's who's that who's that for? It's for Bob. Mm. It's planting it's 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 mental it's mentalism. It's planting ideas, seeds into his brain. It's ne- <clears throat> neuro- neuro-suggestive programming. Just psychological operations, man, yeah. He said at one point, whilst he was on the base, they took him down a corridor, one-armed guard either side of him, and they marched him down this uh, corridor and there were gla- glass windows on either side with offices. And uh, he glances into this one window and sees a military officer talking to what looks like a tiny little grey child-sized being and he sees it just for a second, looks back, and it's gone. Mm. And he said, but it, he he even described it as a dummy. Like, he, th- this is just games. This is psychological games. Mm-hmm. And then if he's been employed as a scientist, as a physicist, to work on one specific aspect of this propulsion system, we know that it's all need to know. He's not going to need to know anything, even scientifically, that he doesn't need to know, mm. let alone, um, you know, anthropologically or historically and yet they give him tens of thousands of pages of briefing documents describing the whole history of planet earth the history of the aliens how they got here how they made us i would say that's a bit superfluous to the job 
how, how's that going to gonna help? How's that going to help him fix a, a a proportion system? Well, it's yeah. not. It's it's fed to him knowing that he's going to relay this information. He's meant to blow the whistle. He's meant to spread this information into the community. And that's exactly what he does. If they didn't want him to do it, and he was it was really as it seems like he's just a rogue guy and he's run off with the, with the secrets he'd have been dead you'd have never heard of bob lazar no one would have heard of bob lazar they wouldn't have and then they've got these staged fake death sort of death threats that it, it's all to make it look they tried to run me off the road they're so incompetent that the professional hit squad couldn't just kill some guy in the middle of nowhere you'd be mm -hmm. dead it's it's all it's all it's all for show it's all theater so your belief then is that Bob Lazar was from the start seeded with information, kind of like Richard Doty uh, being out there to feed Paul Benowitz information. The difference is Doty knew what he was doing. Yeah, yeah, I was about to say, okay, that's sure. why you needed plausible deniability for Lazar. That's why you said sure. that he didn't sure make it so he knows, elaborate. Sure, he knows what he's doing, but eventually this seeds the population with the fact that Area 51 is a thing, you know, that the government has crashed craft. This then gets over to the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union goes, oh, shit, maybe we should be very careful because their technology could fucking zap us from the sky. You know, who yeah. knows, right? Well, and yeah. So it's a it's a psyop. And uh, and then also it plays into the cards but, uh, but hey we're, we're seeing right now in history where if this is a great psyop on – you know, the, the Western societies around the world that, you know, were being invaded by some nefarious alien beings, they could say, look, Bob Lazar was in on a program back in the day working for us. And we were trying to get him to get our military um, personnel or like get our technology up to snuff so we can defend the planet or something like maybe you're right. I hope not. <laughs> yeah. Mm -mm. What were we um, gonna say, Robbie? No, I just, uh, just, uh, yeah. I can't, what, what were we even, what were, what were we even talking about? Um, so the movie, uh, it ends really interesting. Oh. So let's talk about the wrap up of it. <laughs> yeah, movie. Good call. Um, yeah. Um, wow. What, what an ending. I mean, that's got to be the surely the best ending. It's big. It's it's huge. Well, it's it's personal. It's very cool. Yeah. The family um, has no father. Yep. Everybody's happy about it. They didn't respect him and like him anyway. If they would, if he would have stuck around and not sucked. Yeah, it's the happiest years. ending ever where, uh, where, where you, like, it's like really, it's actually on the face of it, really tragic ending, but, but it sure does feel good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, he gets oh, to fine. have he gets to have one last snog with a, another human woman before he flies off into space yep yeah yeah and um and then of course spielberg did the special edition and showed people inside the craft didn't he with the re-release of the movie which was not a good idea because the whole point of that is that you want the mystery you want the mystique yeah. you want you know the possibility rather than the confirmation no, yeah yeah nothing you can show can ever meet what's in your mind you know so that was a that was a bad mistake on his part but um yeah we I mean just what an incredible film and john williams score like just incredible just i mean it's just i mean spielberg firing on all cylinders of genius at that point same with john williams um uh, and the cinematography is just like beautiful as well Ahead of its you know, time. Yeah. every single shot i love um, the night shots are like pretty much animated the the starry nights you know yeah vilma sigmund it's just incredible uh, incredible cinematography everything about it yeah, it's just a complete work of genius um and uh i, I always feel like et is is kind of like a close encounters light yeah yeah well E.T. is an amazing film on its own. We'll probably end up doing it at another time, uh, you know, in the future. But um, what what would you rate this film, if you could, uh, out of 10, in terms of its quality, what it does for you in terms of talking about hyper-reality and things that are happening in, in the UFO phenomenon, uh, 
starting with you, Robbie, and then Brandon. <clears throat> well, I'm like a f super, super film snob. So I have to, like, I'm super critical, but like, um, I have to give it nine, like a, like a nine out of 10, to be honest with you, because being super critical, even that's, and that's being super critical. That's being super, score, Robbie. <laughs> that's being super critical. That's yeah, how, yeah. how, how good I think it is. So, yeah. but it's, even though it's flawed, even though it's not perfect, it's, you know, it's like I say, it's a bit flabby sometimes, a little bit slow, a little bit unnecessary in terms of a little bit confusing at points. Um, Those girls need love too. Sorry? Those girls need love too. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't quite hang together, but, um, and yet it does. It's more than the sum of its parts. It's much, much more. And it has images that are so powerful. Um, they just stay with you, just to infuse themselves into your brain forever and there's not many films that can do that and just on that level alone of sort of pure cinema it's um if it's one of spielberg's best films which it clearly is um uh, that's saying something and um uh you know it, it's it's an amazing amazing film and then um ufologically obviously it's still the most um authentic um and historically authentic UFO movie made up to this point. It's also one that I would, if you've not seen it before, and if you are a UFO experiencer, um, don't go in lightly because it could seriously trigger you. Um, um, so, you know, and I know that's from, from, I know a few experiences who still, who are really close to me, who just have seen clips of it and they find it too much, even just based on the clips. Um, mm -hmm. But it is one that many experiences cite as well as there's their favorite movie, best UFO movie. So we obviously did something right with that one. Brandon? Uh, I, I just thought of something actually. We didn't say spoiler alert when we, do you kind of just want to start over? Uh, just so that we can let people know that there's some spoilers in this. Oh, oh did is... I did I do a spoiler then? Just uh, no, no, we're kidding. We the whole damn we're we talking about that. It's a the movie review. It's a, it's a joke, Robbie. It's okay. It's, it's late over there. Don't worry about it. Since 1977, we're allowed to spoil it. <laughs> yeah, right. If you haven't seen it by now, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it would be funny to bring up the spoiler alert comment at the end of the show. So, uh, no, uh, I'm gonna go with 10, 10 out of 10. Uh, again, because of all the cool things uh, that tie around uh, the ancillary phenomena within the film, uh, the call off to Jacques Vallée, uh, the call off to Heineck. Uh, the Devil's Tower reference, the, like I said, all sorts of really cool ways that he tied it, everything in um, cinematography wise. Ufology, it's the best movie. I agree with Robbie on that right next to Battle of Los Angeles, uh, which, which was Robbie's <laughs> first favorite. I know that it's near and dear to his heart. Uh, I only mentioned that, guys, because Robbie hates that film. Um, so <laughs> we uh, so I think it's great. And, uh, you know, just 10 out of 10, because I, I just I want everybody to have a good time, you know, and so it looks like they did. And I'm happy for everybody. I got to be a part of something historical. I mean, you think of everything down to the grip, down to the people that, you know, he auditioned that could run the 40 in two seconds, you know, in the background there. Um, all the kinetic elements to it uh, with, where everybody had to be a track star was really cool. Yeah. So I guess I'll be even more of a film snob uh, just because I found it might be part of the period that this film was made that I almost felt like scenes like this one, the EQ was really off. Like, oh my there's, God, there's noise happening in the background. You know, there's um, all these scenes that happen in the film that are very much like this, uh, especially the very opening scene where, you know, you've got these Mexicans yelling at the, uh, you know, obvious like special ops guys trying to retrieve these planes in the Socorro desert. Um, and everybody's shouting, you don't know who to listen to. You don't know which character is more important. Um, I'm not saying that that is the most important thing when filmmaking, but I think when you isolate one person's speech over the, the other folks in the background, it really helps illustrate what your point to the scene is. And the EQ in certain scenes of this film is really, really off. Um, and the other sort of strike I would say is the gross product placement with Coca-Cola and, you know, the aliens raiding the fridge didn't really matter. It, it to me kind of takes away, doesn't add. 
Um, and I, I, I love the epic ending with the chandelier grand sized uh, UFO that shows up the mothership, so to speak, and lands at the devil's tower. And, you know, we get our humans return to us and then we give them one more human. They fly off into the sky, super slow, mind you. Um, I didn't like the smaller UFOs. Now they did show a varying degree of, of UFOs, but I was surprised that if Steven Spielberg was to make this film a little bit more hyper real, he would use the saucers. He would use the craft that have been witnessed throughout the 60s, 50s, 40s, 70s, at this point too. Uh, you know, triangles have been flying around our skies for a long time at this point too. I was surprised that he just had a lot of like UFOs that looked like birthday cakes and uh, ice cream cones and, you know, kind of family friendly UFOs that were uh, very colorful and just something about that. When I was a kid and I first saw this film, it was amazing. It was awe inspiring, but um you know, that's the one thing that dates this film a bit more is is the uh, ice cream UFOs that I would describe. So I'll give it an eight. It's still an amazing film, but uh, you even said it, you said Robbie, uh, said it yourself, Robbie, like Steven Spielberg says, this film is the one that dates him the most. And uh, you really see it at this point. You, you, you understand how much it dates itself um, with certain aspects of the film. Do you have a rebuttal to that? I have a slight defense of, of billionaire Steven Spielberg, um, who like, <laughs> I like pointing out his monetary success. <laughs> um, but like, well, like, like he did, like he needs to feel like Steven it's important. Spielberg needs, yeah, yeah, needs yeah, yeah. to defend it. Uh, <laughs> is, um, on the, on the, um, those early scenes that you point out with the uh, the multi-layered sound where everything's this cacophony of of everyone competing to be heard, he did that very consciously because that's very unusual for Spielberg uh, directorially. That's very unusual, and in terms of sound design, it's very unusual for him. Um, he did it in a few of his earlier movies. He did it in Jaws as well in a couple of scenes. He does it in E.T. and Poltergeist as well. And then after that, yeah. he, kind of, he kind of lets that go. He doesn't really do that again in his movies. Um, but that stems from as you say, like his own family and there were like prop... So, but the, but the, the main reason he does that in Close Encounters and why it's, why it's such a big thing in that film and it is like distracting almost, like you say, almost derails it. <laughs> is because he's trying to make a commentary on communication. Those scenes are all about communication. The entire theme, the overriding theme of the film is communication. Mm. Um, like when communication with the aliens at the end through different forms of light and sound, um, uh, communication between families, between individuals, um, between the government and the people and et cetera, et cetera. It's all just sort of different levels of, of, of communication. And I think he was, well, from what, I've, from what I understand about the movie and from interviews I've just seen, um he 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 was trying to go for something along those lines whether it succeeded i don't know but that's what he was trying to do i think so i don't so i think it was conscious on his part um but i agree it's not it doesn't make for pleasant viewing in those in those sequences um and then uh what was the other thing you said the 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 product placement the coca-cola uh, uh, the fridge being rated the on the style uh, yeah, of the style of the UFOs, yeah, ice cream, yeah. cake, UFOs. Like he could have made th those scenes a little bit more hyper real. I mean, people have reported supposed motherships in the past, but he could have just used em embraced those opportunities to uh, use real UFO shapes that have been appearing throughout history at that time. I know what you're saying. To be really fussy though. <laughs> On a, on a, on a, to be a real UFO geek, um, you, you, there's every type of UFO. You, you draw any, any shape, 
and someone will have seen that as a UFO. Mm -hmm. An ice cream cone, a birthday cake, double decker bus, a guitar, like Star, pretty much. Tic -tac, I mean, all of it. A too. tic tac, like pretty much they come obviously they're most famous for being in the saucer shape but even the saucer itself is uh is representative of like a whole range of broadly disc and oval shaped objects which people report dozens and dozens and dozens which would conform just to the flying saucer and you've got the triangles different different types of triangles pyramids spheres cylinders he did cigars. show the sphere he showed the red orb um it always was at the back of the the pack of four yeah, that would pass yeah. by it would be the last one to arrive at the devil's tower uh scene and it was yeah. also the last to pass that highway sort of mountain pass where all those people had the experience at the starting of the film and i liked yeah. that ufo because many people have reported orbs orbs yeah. are a very popular yeah. ufo to see um mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it was just like more of the ice cream cone and yeah. <laughs> go on, sorry, so on, so on. Uh, go on, you're right, you're right. No, no, that's right, but no, but I mean, like you know, I, that's I mean, um, I know I I understand what you're saying, and um, and I think, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, obviously, so the most famous is, is the is the is the saucer and the sphere and the triangle, but I think in reality, when you get down to it, if you look at all of the different words uh, that you know that have been used to describe these things in the sky pretty much have flying jellyfish octopuses yeah. a flying table you know like a flying humanoid. chair or like yeah. humanoid things flying which could humanoid be humanoid things flying mean little aliens in it yeah uh, um so you know, yeah but and to the birthday cake one it's kind of like a nod to the billy, Ma billy meyer case right so it's kind of like another was pepper very in. hope some of that was heavily hoaxed it's mm -hmm. it's interesting yes but that's kind of another nod by spielberg to historical or the ufology type of a uh, element to it you know people that people report fact or not like serpo like uh, billy meyer again with the uh, devil's tower thing it's really cool it's, it's just interesting that he peppered another thing in you know with just well, yeah, I mean, the design of one of the craft yeah yeah that's, i think that was designed by doug trumbull that the, the, that craft and um of course doug trumbull is you know big into ufos himself um the legendary special effects designer who did um blade runner hmm you know, and to, to Darcy's point about uh, the audio, the, um, it seems like, yes, communication is a common theme or the theme of the entire movie. That's why it's called Close Encounters, right? That's an encounter uh, of a communication. But it's interesting how it did start very um, discombobulated. You couldn't hear anything. It was unarticulable. Um, it was loud. It was windy. It was uncomfortable and chaotic, right? And then as you go through, of course, the family dynamic, which drove him to want to shag ass off this planet and go leave with not only strangers, but strange entities. Um, then that kind of uh, harshness in the audio, I think it, I took it as just something that just was reflective of the emotion he was trying to impart in the scene. And then, of course, you get to the very last scene, which is the ultimate contact, which is what the context been leading up to. This is incredibly deep, powerful, acoustic interaction that's amazing and whimsical. And like it's like a relief. It's completely juxtaposition to his any, any interactions or communications that were portrayed in the film on Earth. Yeah, yeah. It's incredible, absolutely incredible. Um, I want to watch it. I haven't watched it. In, I haven't watched it in a few years, actually. Yeah, so. just, saw it. just saw it again to freshen up, man. But it was good. It's really yeah. Good. I watched it last night. And made all these notes and added these clips. Now, just I, really quickly, um, Robbie, before we let you go, um, I wanted to ask: when you investigated this film, who in the film, you know, who, what creative talents did you reach out to, and did you get? um you know confirmation of certain things related to the ufo phenomenon like what was your journey like in terms of that oh it was a long one um the, i mean the book is the product of probably about 10 years of research about six years of and about four and about about six years of research and about four years of writing and um my views on the phenomenon changed quite dramatically before you know but between the time of starting and finishing the book um i learned a lot met a lot of interesting people spoke to quite a lot of filmmakers writers directors producers in the industry wherever wherever i could i would try to go to the source of a of a rumor or of an idea 
if there were any conspiracy theories floating around in ufology and the subculture about particular ufo movies and directors i would try to root it out i would try to to take that back to the source and to try to interview the director or the writer or someone associated with them or who knew them who could comment on it um because there's just far too many you know rumors and theories and and i wanted to to try to verify as much as i could and yeah what i found was that certainly the uh the, the idea of a hollywood ufo conspiracy is too simplistic a term to sort of you know slap on this this complex um process really which is both cultural and political but largely cultural um the, this process whereby this phenomenon which still doesn't officially exist is just upon the periphery peripheries of, of being accepted into the popular popular debate now this phenomenon has managed to find its way into the psyche of pretty much everyone in the modern western world and generally globally i would say someone has a con a conception of what a flying saucer is and what an alien looks like and that's been a result of real world details from grassroots reports finding their way into uh, mass media through various pop cultural routes and but losing their original authenticity in the process by the time they reach the audience and being consumed as entertainment or whatever their roots in reality have been distorted through this process of filmmaking um uh through the process of, of of representation and then reception on the part of the audience uh and the message or the idea that it was originally imbued with is, is distorted and changed and so it's still there to be found if people want to go back through history and read the literature and educate themselves and not rely solely on mass media products to get their education about about this phenomenon which i think most people have and that's why it's so easy to exploit because uh we're primed now to view this phenomenon in a certain way in a way that's been presented to us on the whole by by the entertainment industry and then once you've narrativized all of that um uh you can you've primed everyone and you can exploit it and that's what worries me because uh because the phenomenon right now is being completely um exploited monopolized by 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 by, by you know discussions of of potential threat and hostility and uh, anyone who's done any any research on the subject at all knows that the phenomenon has been with us for as long as we've been here and um doesn't seem to pose any active hostile threat whatsoever and um people need to start sort of using their own instinct i think and intuition about what about what all of this represents could not agree more where can people find your work if they want to uh, read your books? Uh, this is your chance to sort of plug, you know, uh, your wares. Keep in mind, we will be linking this in the show notes for you. So audience, you guys can just go down, click in the show notes down here and we'll uh, link, click a link right there. Boom. Just go get it. It's a great book. Well, thanks guys. Um, yeah. Uh, you can get my books, um, silver screen sources, uh, sorting fact from fantasy and Hollywood UFO movies, uh, any good online bookstore um, on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, um, all around the world really. And then you can get the uh, edited volume, which is um, UFOs Reframing the Debate, which is a collection of 15 essays sort of trying to dismantle what we think we know about UFOs and ufology um, and put it all back together again that's uh that's available too you know online and um so uh yeah i'd encourage you to to check them out thanks hey, robbie yeah. man you're you're uh king of kings and really appreciate your insights into this film and and the work that you've been doing and researching ufos for a long time now and and uh, i've only just scratched the surface on your book i i'm going to continue to read and i Highly implore anybody listening to check out his books. They're awesome. Thanks so much, guys. And that is Brandon's yeah, ass. Oh, first. here's the books.
Well, I was going to show you some. Thank you again, um, Robbie. So Robbie uh, reintroduced uh, through August Night Press, his press company. Uh, he has, so here's the original copy. And then you have done re-release versions of two of Bud Hopkins' books. Uh, you have Missing Time. And then you also have Intruders. Great job, That's Robbie. That's right. So Thanks, thank you for sending yeah. me these, Bubba. I appreciate you. Oh, you're so welcome. I just thought you're it welcome. was cool. And I was like, oh, yeah. Um, so thank you so much. Again, uh, August Night Press, guys, and I'll link uh, how to find these as well because they are reissues of Bud Hopkins. And uh, thanks again for doing this, man. This was great, Robbie. I, I actually it. have thanks, the guys. original Missing Time. That's awesome. How weird. Well, and I, I have the original it. Intruders. We're adorable, Dars. <laughs> if you guys have any suggestions for future movies, please write them into our email. Darcy, what's our email? Uh, media at occultjourneys.com. Dope. Uh, write them in if you got any suggestions, any guest suggestions.